Hey everybody, how you doing? This is Topher Scott with the Hockey Think Tank and thanks for having me at your conference. Uh, in my presentation today, I'm going to talk about creating connection within your program. And, you know, I'm a big believer that personal relationships is our most important job as, as coaches or as directors. So uh, I'm going to talk a lot about building relationships, uh, how we build relationships, why they're important, and ultimately how creating connection can lead to a better culture and how creating connection, I think, can, can lead to wins and losses at the end of the day as well. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys here now put on a little bit of a slideshow and we will get going. So I'm going to talk about creating connection in your organization or within your program. And the basic three things uh, that I'm going to talk about here today is creating connection through the relationship of the coach to the player, uh, from the player to the player, and also from the players and the whole organization to something bigger than themselves. And to start it off, we'll start with coach to player. And I think there's two basic questions that are really important to talk about when it comes to coach player relationship. And the first one is how well do you know your players? And then the second one, which we probably don't invest as much time in is, you know, how well do your players know you as well? And I think we're going to talk about a lot. I think it's important as a coach to, to let them in um, and for them to get to know you and, and to be vulnerable as a coach. Um, I think it's really important to get to know your players, find out what makes them tick, find out how to motivate them. Um, and then, but on the other side, you got to do the same as well. You got to open up and, and you got to let your players in a little bit uh, as well, because with that comes the power of shared story. I think as you get to know your players, you'll, you'll find out a lot about what their story is. Um, and, you know, they, they go through some good times, they go through some bad times, and there's a reason why everybody is the way that, uh, you know, the way that they are. And uh, with that story, I think you'll come to realize as a coach that you have gone through a lot of the same things and similar things that your players have gone through. So um, the more you have that shared story within and, and you can talk about those things and, and help them to get through maybe some of the tough times through sharing some of the experiences that you've had on your own, uh, I think that can really help to build that relationship, um, which will allow you to coach that player on, uh, on just a better level. Um, so to start it off, coach to player, um, I, I think, again, it's about letting them into who you are. The more they can get to know you, um, the, the better you'll be able to, to empathize with them and things like that. And, and what that does is three things. And, and number one, you have to be authentic. You have to be you. I think we've all had coaches who you always know they've been kind of playing an angle when they're talking to you to try to get you to do something that they want you. But I think you know, players, they can see right through that. So you, you have to be you. I think it's a mistake that a lot of coaches make, especially coaches that aren't necessarily the, the hard drivers and disciplinarians, um, which a lot of us think we have to be as a coach. But I, I think you've seen that there's a lot of coaches out there that uh, do things differently. You know, maybe they are more comfortable taking kids out to lunch um, or, you know, pulling kids aside and, and having more positive conversations with them um, and, and doing things like that rather than always being so hard. But sometimes as a coach, we think we need to be this hard driver. And, and a lot of times that doesn't work if it's not in your personality. Um, so you got to be authentically you. Number two, you got to be vulnerable. You got to let them see the real you. Um, I think the best coaches uh, have a gift of being vulnerable and, and sharing some of the things that they've been through and really opening up to the players. I think it humanizes you as a coach to a certain extent as well. And, uh, you know, the players are, are more apt to kind of listen to you if they, they see you as a human being rather than just, you know, you're the coach and, and, and you're supposed to make me a better hockey player. Um, and then the last thing, you got to put yourself in, in your player's shoes. Uh, we were all at, at that age once. Uh, we've been through a lot of the same things that, that they're going through right now. And again, a lot of times as coaches, we instruct uh, and we kind of talk at the players. But I think it's important as a coach, you got to ask questions. You got to see where the kids are coming from rather than always just instructing all the time, just asking questions about what they're seeing, what they're feeling, what they're, they're going through. I, I think just the more you can develop that bond through putting yourself in their shoes and then empathizing with some of the situations that they're in. Uh, I just think it's a powerful, powerful thing. And, and you'll be uh, much more able to, to coach a player that gets to know you and you get to know them really well, uh, especially when the times are tough, which, uh, which we'll get to now building relationships relationships, that is something that doesn't just happen. It takes a lot of work because there's a lot that goes into a, a player's story. Um, and there's a lot to, that goes into getting to know that story of the players. And a lot of times we just kind of see the surface 
when the kids come to the rink. And, and I love this graphic here. You may know me, but you have no idea who I am. So what we see at the rink, like there's a reason why people are the way that they are. There's a reason why people act in a certain way. And as coaches, if we can dig a little deeper and get to know the why of, of why kids are acting certain ways or why they do things in a certain way, uh, we can be better able to, to coach them as we shepherd them through their journey of being a hockey player. So I have on here, you know, it takes intentional effort and preparation. I think the best coaches, they have um, what I call a communication plan. Every day they have three or four players that may need to, to reach out to, whether it's, you know, a full on meeting, whether it's just, Hey, how you doing? Whether it's just bringing them in to talk about something that isn't just hockey. I think um, they're just prepared and they have a plan of what they're going to do. And, and I, it's, it's proactive versus reactionary communication. Like I have on the slide here, I think, um, you know, these, these coaches, they, they get, it's just a simple way of saying it. They're proactive about it. A lot of times we're reactionary. If somebody does something bad, or if we need to hold somebody accountable, we'll bring them in and we'll talk to them rather than, you know, doing it on a semi-consistent basis where we're getting to know people on, on a different level. And I think that a lot of the best coaches, uh, they have those plans and they do that. You know, one of the things that, that I like to do, I like to watch a lot of documentaries on sports and two really good ones was there was one on ESPN plus about Alabama football. And there was another one on ESPN plus uh, about Duke basketball. And at the beginning of every season, coach Saban and coach Krzyzewski, they bring uh, whether it's just the freshman, their entire team over to their house. And, and it just humanizes them. Um, you know, they're in, in the pool playing volleyball with coach Krzyzewski's kids and grandkids. Uh, you know, the Alabama football, Football, they go to coach uh, Saban's lake house and they get to hang out with the family and do some tubing. And, and uh, it just, again, it, it, it takes the pressure off um, because there's a lot of pressure when you're playing at, at high stakes, like these guys are playing. Um, and it just allows everybody to kind of open up and, and to get to know, know each other on a different level. And I think, uh, again, that's, that's really, really important. So what are we doing when we do this as coaches, when we're building those relationships as players, I think it, it builds a trust. It builds a trust between the coach and the player. And that comes really, really handy when we're trying to coach our players hard, because at the end of the day, like if our, if our players know that we care about them, the harder you can push them because they know it's coming from a good place that you want the best for them. So it's building that unity between coach and player through that relationship. Um, and, and this is a great saying here, Pat Quinn, one of the most decorated coaches of all time, players don't care how much, you know, until they know how much you care. And I think, <laughs> you know, that, that saying has been tossed around a lot of different times, but it's, it's so true. You can, you can do so much more and you can push kids so much harder if they know that you care about them. But again, that takes a lot of intentional effort. That takes a lot of work. That takes a lot of preparation. Uh, but I think the best coaches do a phenomenal job of making sure that's one of the most important things that they do throughout a day and throughout a season is that they're connecting with their players. They're getting to know their players. Their players are getting to know them. And ultimately, that's where that bond of trust comes and is huge uh, when it comes to coaching. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is fostering those relationships between players on a team. And, you know, when we talk about what we miss uh, about playing hockey, a lot of times it's we miss the boys, we miss the girls, we miss being in the locker room, just kind of shooting the breeze with everybody and just hanging out. Um, and, you know, those relationships that are formed, I think everybody that's listening probably still has a best friend or two that they played with at some capacity uh, within their hockey careers. And, you know, when it comes to building connection between players, um, I can't stress how important that is because I know that the best teams that I've ever been on have been the closest. And some of the teams that really struggled, there really wasn't that camaraderie and that love for each other because that stuff translates. If there's a love for each other off the ice, you're going to want to block shots. You're going to want to sacrifice for each other so much more than if there's not that connection, you know? And so um, I just think as coaches, it's really important to put our players in situations and talk to them a lot about how important 
building that camaraderie within the group and that unity is. And what I'll talk about here is there's a formal aspect to it, I think. And then I think there's also an informal aspect to building those relationships within the group. Uh, so to start off, you know, I think you can do uh, a lot of formal activities as a team, whether it's bringing in speakers, uh, whether it's doing, you know, things like scavenger hunts, um, just uh, uh, there's so many different creative things that you can do uh, as a coach. Uh, I know some of the, the good, nice things that we did when I was a coach uh, for Cornell at the division one level, you know, we brought in some military people. We sat down and we did some identity building. Uh, we sat down and did some uh, values building activities where we would get on the same page and then we'd put those values, you know, up on the wall. I think those things are, are huge into building that, that unity and just kind of like the identity of what we're all about as a group. Uh, another formal activity that we did uh, in my time at Cornell, both as a player and then, you know, it's been carried on for years is I like to call it initiation. And the initiation isn't probably what you're thinking it is. Uh, our initiation for me at Cornell was the first day that we got to campus. And when I arrived at our dorm, I had six players on the team that were there ready for me. They came in, they took all of my stuff, my, my luggage, the boxes, everything that I had, they moved me up to my room, they helped me unpack, and I was done within 10 minutes. And it happened for every single one of my teammates and it's happened, it's a tradition uh, that's been going on at Cornell for, for a long time. And, and at that moment, I knew already a little bit of what this culture was going to be all about. You know, the guys were there, they were waiting for me to get, and that was a formal thing that, um, you know, that we talked about as coaches and we paired uh, certain players with freshmen that were coming in. And uh, it was a huge part to feeling welcome as a freshman and building that camaraderie again within that group. So doing formal activities, team building activities, I, I think uh, is, is, is crucial to, to building that connection within the group. And then what's probably honestly more important is the informal activities that, uh, that the players do on their own. And so the first one that I want to talk about is the meeting after the meeting. And so I had uh, the opportunity to listen to Mike Babcock talk at some juncture. I can't remember what conference it was at, but he talked about the meeting after the meeting. And basically, you know, what he said is I can go in into a locker room and, and I can give the best speech or put the best X's and O's up on, uh, on the wall and, and do everything that I think is necessary as a coach to help our, our players succeed. But at the end of the day, what's more important isn't that meeting. It's the meeting when everybody goes home and they're talking about it informally over dinner or playing video games or as they're just kind of hanging out watching TV or something. What are those conversations like? And so if those conversations are negative and if those conversations are, you know, people are talking behind each other's backs or, you know, they're talking about the coach in, in a certain way, you know, that can be extremely destructive to, to a team. And we've probably all been there <laughs> that, that kind of energy and that kind of talk is, is contagious, but so is, is positively. And so I think it's really important as a coach to talk about those meetings after the meetings. And if those meetings after the meetings aren't very good, then, Hey, let's, instead of letting it fester, instead of letting it go. And we've all been there too, where it just, it festers for a long time and it just adds to negativity within the room. Let's address it right away. Whether you guys think that you can address it as leaders within the room or whether you think that's something we need to address as, as a coaching staff, let's get all on the same page. So if you hear that negativity in those meetings after the meetings away from the rink, let's make sure we're, we're stopping it and we're addressing it in, in the right way. Um, so just the meetings are so, so important in college. I was a college hockey coach for a long time. Uh, it's already built uh, where there's a class system. And if you're playing junior hockey, you're playing pro hockey, there's a little bit of a class system, veteran rookie, um, that, that, that happens. And it's just a natural part of, of a team. And, and I think doing activities where you're mixing, the older players and the younger players, and you're kind of all mixing within each other. One of the in, uh, informal activities that we would do, which was driven by the players at Cornell is we would take one person in each class and they had to take, so it was four guys and they had to go do something. They could go bowling, they could go golf, they can go to a movie, they can go to a dinner, whatever it was that was up to them, but they had to get to know each other. They had to do something uh, again to build that connection, that unity relationships within, and then we would switch. So different players would be going with different players. And I think, you know, from our feedback, um, you know, from our players, it, it's something that uh, really, really grew and they really, really enjoyed. So on a lot of teams, there's already that class system. And the worst thing you can have on a team is clicks worst thing you, we've all been there 
clicks, it, it, it just forms divides within the team and is never good. So informal activities that the players are doing on their own, where they're all on the same page and getting to know each other. I, I think that really builds that connection. And, and when I go around and I do my team building activities with college teams, junior teams, and, and, and even youth teams, you know, we, we talk about this. We talk about how important these informal activities are and, and the players, their feedback to me is man, they're like, man, we just, we don't do it. This is really important. And we don't do enough of this. We gotta, we gotta do more. We got to do more. So I think the players understand that. And as coaches, we can put them in situations where we're empowering those players to really um, put a lot of time and effort into these informal activities between themselves, you know, as a group. And then the last thing I want to talk about when it comes to the player to player relationships is that all elusive accountability. And this is something that um, is one of the most powerful things that I talk about when I do my team building, especially with the older teams, because accountability they'll all agree is really really important within the player group i'll ask them okay hey guys what's more important if a coach holds you accountable or if one of your teammates holds you accountable and every single player goes it's it's more powerful if our teammates hold us accountable but hey like that's really really hard it's hard to hold your teammates and best friends uh, accountable and be hard on them and get into them if, if need be. But again, it's, it's so much more powerful. So the things that we talk about is number one, we, we just take the elephant in the room. We say, okay, Hey guys, like this is really important, right? <laughs> They're like, yeah, absolutely. So we have that discussion, but we talk about authenticity. We talk about how certain people are much more comfortable in holding their teammates accountable in a certain way. Like there's some players that can get into people. There's some players that are okay being hard on guys and, and they can kind of get into them. And then there's other players that aren't really good at that, but they can still be good leaders and they can still hold people accountable in their own way. We talked about it a little bit uh, before uh, from a coaching standpoint, you know, players can take guys out to lunch. Players can put their arm around and just kind of say, Hey, what's going on? Hey, I think, you know, I, I know you're trying, but I think we just need a little bit more focus out of you. You know, there's certain ways to hold people accountable. There's not one way. So we talk about having an authentic voice when holding people accountable. Um, that's that's kind of true to yourself as a player. And, and then you kind of start to see the players, their shoulders kind of, you know, they sink a little bit. Okay, the pressure's off a little bit. And, and then the other thing we talk about is, you know, there's an authentic way that everybody likes to be held accountable as well. Some people are fine getting into. Some people are fine being yelled at or screamed at whatever there's other players that aren't there's other players you got to put an arm around there's other players you got to have a little bit more of a, a deeper conversation with to kind of get through to them and so we talk about how every person has you know their unique ability to hold people accountable we all have our unique abilities and how we like to be held accountable as well and we go through a, you know an exercise where we kind of get to know that within each other and it, we have fun with it and i think the players really really enjoy it and then the last thing that i do that's really really powerful is like I say, okay, guys, look, we all recognize that this is really, really important, right? Raise your hand if you think so. Everybody raises their hand. And then we say, okay, we all know this is really important. Let's take an oath right now that if our teammates are holding us accountable, it's not personal. It's out of love. It's out of respect. And it's just about making sure that you're being the best you and you're bringing the best of what you can to the team. They're just trying to make you better. Guys, can we seriously sit here and talk about how important it's not personal? And then so we go around and everybody looks each other in the eye and says, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay being held accountable. And it's really, really powerful. Honestly, I think it's the, it's the most powerful thing and one of the most influential things that we can do as coaches. And it's just addressing that, talking about it, and then talking about the why and talking about the how that we can hold each other accountable. And it's, it's, just, it's a powerful thing. And when we do that, when we build that, that camaraderie within the group, it builds unity, especially through adversity. Um, teams that love each other will get through adverse times way better than teams that don't care for each other because they come together as a group rather than fraction off. Um, I would imagine all of us here have been on teams where both has happened. Um, but if you go down a goal or maybe something happens off the ice where you got to pull together, it's not going to be easy. Uh, when, when you've have those relationships built and there's that love there, people get out of that a lot easier than they do if there's not. So that's why it's really, really important to build that 
unity through the group because in, how it, in a season, there's always going to be times of adversity. There's always going to be tough times. Even Stanley Cup teams, you know, they'll say that adversity was the best thing that happened to them throughout the season. So um, building those relationships helps you to get through that. Um, and then the last thing that I'm going to talk about here after I take a swig of water is um, just the importance of the players and the team playing to something bigger than just themselves. I think when you're playing for something more important than you, it does a lot of great things in terms of giving you perspective of what you're playing for. And it gives you a little bit more of a why um, to, to why you're playing. Um, so what we'll talk about here, um, again, you can talk about something in terms of uh, a past and a future. So kind of like a tradition, uh, that you're, you're upholding, uh, talking about something that's uniquely yours as a team, and then just talking about uh, a perspective, uh, like I talked about as well. So the first thing we'll talk about is past future. Uh, and you can do this at the youth level. You can do this at the junior level. You can do this at the college level, especially. Um, and you can do this um, even at the professional level, I, I think, uh, as well. So um, something big at the college level is, is talking about tradition and alumni. And you can do that a lot uh, at any level. Uh, you know, one of the things we used to talk about at Cornell is, you know, you have to be grateful and thankful to the people that came through the program before because they laid the foundation and they laid the expectations for what you are trying to accomplish. So at Cornell, always one of the top teams. And we thought it was really important to talk about um, the expectations. We are expected to win. And we are expected to win because teams previous to us won. And how much more fun is it to come to the rink when there's that expectation of winning a national championship every single year? And so you play to that tradition and you want to honor that tradition. You want to honor the alumni that came through this program before you did. And again, you can do that at every single level, I think putting it up on your website, you know, the players that have moved on to do great things and not even necessarily the players that moved on to do great hockey things, but just being in the community, got a lot of, you know, maybe there's people high ups in the business world, or maybe there's doctors that are saving people's lives. You know, maybe there's, uh, there's just so many great things that people, I think it's important to talk about that all the time and it's important to talk about how those people laid the foundation for what you are. And, and, and what a lot of teams do is you're playing for your town. You're playing for your city. Uh, I'm recording this the same night that the Islanders beat the Tampa Bay lightning to force a, a game seven. And you can see how much that team means to that long Island area. And so I think that adds just such a, such a greater appreciation for why you're playing. And, and, you know, as, as players, especially youth players that are coming up, but even professional, it's so easy to get bogged down in just yourself. I'm on my individual mission to be the best I can be. I want to make it. Um, but when you can add something bigger, like a tradition, like the people that came before you, like the town or the city that you're playing for, God, that's, that's a, that's just a powerful thing on top of that. And, and not counter to that, but something that I think um, you need to kind of massage with that is something that's uniquely yours as a team for that year. Every team has a different journey. Every team wants to leave a legacy um, and leave a place better than where they found it. Right. So um, I think talking about the journey, something that's yours, you know, having a team model, having team sayings, you know, the sayings on your shirt, the things on the back, something that only your team understands. I, I know there's one team uh, that I worked with in the past that I think their team slogan was something to the effect of nobody knows only we know because only we know the work that we put out. Only we know the sacrifice that, that we've, uh, that we've made to, to do what we do to make sure that we're successful as individuals and as a team, only we know. And so doing something like building a team motto, it's a little bit kind of hokey, but it's still, there's, there's a lot of merit to that. So, um, you know, doing something uniquely yours for your team that you can add to the, the greater picture of your program or of your organization, again, can be a very, very powerful thing. And then, you know, just, I, I think playing for something bigger, it, it gives you perspective. Um, so many people are under so much pressure, especially kids to win 
or to make it that you, you really want to talk about, hey, what are you really playing for here? Why are you really playing? Because most kids would talk about, hey, I play because I love it. And when you talk to teams, like what's the most important thing? And it's, it's playing for the boys or playing for the girls, playing for the, you know, the crest on the front. And I think that always needs to be communicated um, from an individual standpoint and from a team standpoint, because again, it, it, I think it de-stresses the, the kids, can de-stress you as, as a coach as well. And, and I think at the end of the day, it can help to form that identity of, of what you're looking to be as a team. You know, what are you playing for? Who are you playing for? Why are you playing? Um, I, I just think communicating that consistently, uh, it gives perspective and it can help you come together as a group, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to get kids to buy in. We're trying to get players to, to really focus on the we instead of the me. And you can do that a lot by um, giving them perspective and get a lot of that by focusing on things that are greater and and phil jackson uh, i've read all of his books if if you haven't read any of his books i encourage you to because they're they're phenomenal and i'm from chicago so you know i grew up in his chicago bulls days and and got to kind of see it firsthand if you haven't seen the last dance again that's uh um, that documentary on Netflix or ESPN uh, about the Chicago Bulls and their run. I encourage you to watch that as well. But he has a great saying right here. As I see it, my job as a coach was to make something meaningful out of one of the most mundane activities on the planet, playing pro basketball. Despite all the glamour surrounding the sport, the process of playing day after day in one city after another can be a soul numbing exercise. And he did such an unbelievable job of teaching the players their place in where they are in this whole world that they're in, because it's such a small thing, you know, even playing basketball at the highest levels, playing in front of millions of people and all the pressure that comes with it. It's really a, a, a small thing. And so he got them to really enjoy and embrace the journey and embrace the community of, of their team and their town and, and everything of, of what they were doing. Um, and it, it just, it, it helped them, I think, to, to really uh, succeed and have a lot of the, the great uh, accolades, both team and individual that they were. And, and, you know, Michael Jordan, you saw from the documentary, he wasn't going to play for another coach for the Bulls aside from, from Phil Jackson. And uh, I think that was a huge part of the reason why he was so singularly focused on being the best ever. And Phil Jackson got out of the greatest player ever that understanding of, Hey, this isn't about you, dude. This is about something that's much bigger than you. And so um, just communicating that with your own players and your team, just a very, very powerful thing. And again, you build that unity that we've been talking about with everything else through that perspective. Um, even the perspective of if you do a team building activity, going uh, to interact with maybe children with special needs or going to interact with the homeless, it, it gives you a perspective where um, it, it teaches them to be grateful for the things that they have as a group and how lucky they really are to, to be in the situations um, that they're in. So just building that perspective of something bigger, it can build a unity within the group. Um, and that's, again, ultimately what we're looking for as coaches. And, and again, uh, I have this slide here to, to end things off for the most part. This is the All Blacks. If you haven't read the book Legacy by James Kerr, um, aside from maybe Phil Jackson and the Bulls, um, I don't know if anybody else is on par with them in terms of really getting players to understand the greater whole of what they're doing. Um, there's such an identity that they have. There's such a unity and a purpose and a meaning for why they play and what they do. And it really comes out in that book. And, and I encourage anybody and everybody that's listening to this right now, go get that book legacy because you can really learn a lot about building culture and all of the things that I've been talking about, about creating connection um, with the all blacks. And that's the, the rugby team uh, from New Zealand. So um, just to kind of end things off here, uh, when we're creating connection through this investment that we're doing in building relationships, number one, it starts with getting the right people on the bus. You want to have people within your organizations that really value those personal relationships. And it starts in, in the recruiting process, really getting to know the families, you know, that you want to have a part as uh, that you want to have a part of your program. Um, you want to get the right people on the bus. So it starts in recruiting. Number two, and we talked about it, you have to prepare 
for your communication structures. Everybody should have a communication structure and a plan for how you're going to be reaching out to your players. And it's, it's, it's an investment. The work that you're putting in, in building this connection, it will, the, you know, it's going to come through tenfold. Um, the, the return on your investment in doing that, because you're going to build unity, you're going to build trust. And, and that's what, you know, we ultimately want to do. And then the last thing is what, what is your why? I think as coaches, you know, if you, and I've had millions of conversations with coaches out there. Um, if you ask a coach why they got into coaching, I would say 90 to 95% of the coaches that I've spoken to will say, because I want to have a positive impact on the players. Okay. And, and I will challenge every single coach that says that, okay, prove it. How are you going to make a positive impact on the players? And I'm sure most people would say it's through building relationships, you know, and it's very, very easy to say that it's a lot more difficult to actually, like we were talking about, prepare and invest your time into doing it. It takes a lot of work, but if that is something that you think is the most important part of your job as an educator, uh, as a mentor, as a coach, then I think you really have to put your money where your mouth is and you really have to do the things that you say are important. And that's, again, it's not easy, but I think the best coaches that I've been able to interact with and, and talk to from the, the NHL level all the way to the youth levels. That's something that they do very, very, very well. So I appreciate your time here today. Hopefully you got something out of, uh, of this presentation here. Um, I, I wanted to put my contact info on here. My email's up there, Topher at the hockey think tank.com. I'm very active on social media, on Twitter, uh, at Topher Scott. And actually this is, uh, I need to change this. It's actually at the hockey think tank now. Um, so I forgot to change this slide. I, I just recently did that. Um, but, uh, my Twitter handle is at the hockey think tank. Um, my Instagram is hockey think tank as well. And then, um, I do a podcast, uh, with my cousin who was a professional hockey player back in the day. And now he trains professional hockey players all the way to youth players off the ice. Uh, we do a podcast, uh, called the hockey think tank podcast. We've been doing it for a couple of years now. Um, we've brought on great guests and we talk about a lot of the things that we talked about here. Um, just trying to add, uh, as much education and, and inspiration to the hockey world as, uh, as we can. So, uh, check that out as well. Uh, feel free to reach out. Um, I'm available to you at any time. I love having conversations with people. I want to get better as well. So if you have feedback on this conversation, uh, or this presentation, or you want to have a conversation, uh, please feel free to reach out at any time. So I very, very much appreciate all your time. Uh, hopefully you get some more out of some of these other presentations as well. And best of luck as you head into your seasons.